Hey, it has been a second since I did a monthly reading wrap up, but let's go ahead and do June. I have talked about most of these, to be fair, because while I'm not in as hard of a slump as I was, I'm still not up to my ideal normal reading speed because I think I just have to accept that my life and my pace of life is a little different right now. So I've talked about a decent number of these. I will refer to those I have talked about in case you've missed any and you may not go as in-depth with some of that. So the first book I read is one I have already talked about and that is Siren Queen by Nevo. If you loved The Chosen and The Beautiful last year, also by Nevo, I think you'll really enjoy this. Both play on similar themes of kind of deals with the devil of a sort, but they are in much different veins. Siren Queen is set during the golden age of Hollywood, which isn't usually one of my favorite periods, but I think that Vo puts a really fun, interesting spin on it. Her narratives that I've read, The Chosen and the Beautiful and this one, both have a sense of danger to them. And this is very much more of like a fey fairy bargain, her kind of take on that within the world that is created. And I love the world she creates because she builds this easy magic into everything. So she'll take a world that feels very real, normal, familiar, however you want to frame it, and we will start to get little trickles or hints of something odd on the periphery, and then that is built out and becomes central to the plot. Here also we have this exploration of who gets to portray what kinds of stories on screen and who gets to tell what kinds of stories and what you give up to tell certain kinds of stories or portray certain kinds of things, how you can claim a voice, claim your power, but what roles that puts you into. There are lots of layers to this within a really engaging magical setting. So I definitely think that this is one to read. I also think the tone fits those kind of long summer nights as it starts to get a little cooler and we start to see the darkness creep in at the edges of the day. There are lots of scenes set around giant bonfire type fire pits. There's a liminal space feeling to it all very much a, an atmosphere that I think fits into the kind of waning of summer. So one that if you haven't read, I would definitely keep an eye out for. Okay, and then one I haven't talked about, Wicked Beauty by Katie Robert. This is the newest in the Dark Olympus series. Of course, we just got the Cupid and Psyche retelling Electric Idol earlier this year, so these are coming at us fast and furious. And this is our first thruple. So this is Helen, who we saw in the last book, and also Achilles and Patroclus. And I was very excited to see how she did this. This is something we haven't really seen much in mainstream romance yet. It is a subversion of the love triangle that has kind of permeated everything, right? This idea of having to pick one or the other. And I'm always interested in subversion of expectations. So was excited. I don't know that this was everything I wanted it to be, but I think it was in a kind of very delicate position because there was so much going on. So the book opens up with Helen hurrying to a meeting, a convening of the aristocracy of this world, and they're going to be setting out the process for selecting the next Aries and she is going to submit her name to the competition until she gets there and her brother, who is the newest, Zeus, proclaims her the prize of the competition or one of the prizes, it should be said. But she ends up putting her name in anyway. So she ends up entering this competition and Achilles and Patroclus are also in the competition. They have a long-standing relationship that, you know, fits within the larger narrative. So this definitely has that competition gladiator-esque atmosphere going on. There is a lot of mythology to pull from here and I think this is where we start seeing it deviate the most. We're starting to lay trails that I think we're going to pick up on later. So that's neither here nor there. I don't think that that is necessarily a weakness. I think it is still playing into things in a very 
intelligent way, but there's so much going on here. And I think that that is part of what hinders it. I don't think that it is fully sunk by it by any means. I just think that in comparison with the other two books, it feels a little less tight. And that's kind of sad because I wanted this to shine a little bit more just because it's doing something so different in a lot of ways or you know it's putting something into a more mainstream position than we've seen in that mainstream position yet. I'm sure there are other titles and just saying it's not as common. So I wanted this to do a little bit more and I think part of it is we were contained within this competition and so the emotional resonance didn't feel as there for me as I wanted it to. And I think that when you were dealing with more relationships and there are more people to be digging into, that further complicates things for sure. So I don't know that this was perfect for me, but it was still a lot of fun and I don't begrudge my time reading it at all. I still really enjoyed it. I'm going to be very interested to see what she does with the rest of the series. So yeah, I don't know, but I will say I am really glad that Katie Robert is feeling kind of free to play with the source material and subvert expectations and the way she's using that subversion to make points. I think she's doing everything in a really intelligent, fun way. And I'm very, very excited to see where this series continues to go. And then I read Bitter by Akwenke Amezi. This is the prequel to Pet, as I mentioned, because I have talked about this book more in depth as well. I think that you could read either on its own first in either order, and it's going to give you a slightly different reading experience, of course, but I don't think it's going to rob you of anything in your reading experience. So I really enjoyed this. I wasn't sure how I was going to respond to it in relation to Pet because I really enjoyed Pet. And Pet looks at a utopia and kind of the skeletons in the closet and the way that even a utopia can be corrupted and we have to keep kind of facing our demons and fighting them in order to maintain that utopia. And we know that they were coming from a very dystopian past. And this is the dystopian past. Unfortunately, the dystopian past more closely reflects our current present. And that is part of the reason I've never really personally been drawn to dystopias. Obviously, we had a huge dystopia push in the like 2010s. And I've read a lot of the dystopias, but not all of them by any means, because it's not my favorite genre. So I think that this book is very smart. I love the anger that kind of pulsates, but the anger never feels all consuming. It never feels like a hindrance, but neither does it feel like we are pulling on the anger for the power, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think that we are allowed to be in that anger, but I think it explores a lot of these feelings with a lot of compassion. And it really focuses or puts emphasis on our ability to create community and to make change or foster change through love and not in a kind of like singing around the campfire kind of way where it ignores the reality in the present because this sets up a city that basically feels like a war zone but it presents a possibility for vengeance and retribution and bloodshed that our characters have to grapple with and in many cases fight back against. So I think that it's very smart. I think it opens a lot of conversation. And more importantly, I think it gives a validity to the full range of emotions that someone could be going through in face of oppression. It is compassionate to what any individual feels that they have the capacity for or are capable of. And it also feels like it offers real hope and possibility for change. I think that both Pet and Bitter are brilliant in terms of their tone and the world they create or reflect, and they open really great opportunities for conversation, exploration, digging deeper. I think that these are really fascinating books and would be great for kind of like reading circle discussion type things. As I've said before, I think that Pet would foster really interesting conversations, especially in the classroom. I think there's a lot to dig into with both books. So I'm glad I trusted this book to do what it needed to do because it definitely did. And then flipping back to Greek myth, I listened, but I got a prop to Pandora's Jar by Natalie Haynes. This is the author of A Thousand Ships, which I read last year, 
which takes a look at the women involved with Tangential 2 wrapped up in the Trojan War. And this is a nonfiction title because she is a scholar of Greek mythology. And so it, as it says on the cover, is the women of the Greek myths. And it really digs in to a lot of the complicated women in Greek mythology or really emphasizes how complex the women of Greek mythology are. And it also opens conversation about how these women have been portrayed over the years, whether it's by the poets, the playwrights, what world a lot of these characters came up in, how their stories were changed at different points, how more recent iterations of these stories have been adapted and changed, and how that has entered the cultural consciousness as a kind of truth that I feel in the exploration of Eurydice as much as anything. But even things like Medea, it talks about like why that play came in last in the competition, how that story must have been in the consciousness, what change to that play must have happened to have the audience react in such a visceral way. There's no answers to what change, to be clear, like we don't have a magic answer suddenly, but the fact that it posits and opens these questions, and I love that it opens these questions and these conversations. It looks a little deeper at these women and what happened to them and how active or inactive they were allowed to be in their own stories and just the world around them. I, I really enjoyed it. And I do think it's a really good listen if you're looking for an audiobook because it does, you know, have separate chunks and it's nonfiction, it's interesting. I would recommend for sure. Additionally, if you're working on any mountings of Greek tragedies, I would definitely encourage you to check that out. And then I read Nina LaCour's adult debut, Yerba Buena. This has LaCour's really signature lyrical voice that is rooted by a grief, a sadness, and it's about overcoming that sadness or the life, the moments after the sadness. Because it is her adult debut, because it's an adult fiction, we feel like we're looking back a little bit more than her young adult, which feels like we're looking forward. So while there is still that sense of moving on, moving forward, how we persevere to a certain extent, this book also does kind of mire us in the messiness of these characters' lives that they experience for a while, the hardships, these struggles. And so it is a tough read at times. It is heavy. That being said, I don't think it's hopeless. And I do enjoy that it shows us the complexity of these characters. These are not flawless protagonists. These are characters that have a lot of bad things happen to them outside of their control. But they are also characters that don't always make the best decisions. They feel very real and their stories feel very important. And so we do have to kind of sit in that discomfort for a time. But I think giving them a story and a happy ending of whatever sorts that is, is important. And I will say, you know, the ending is a little bit more open, as I feel like Nina LaCour's always are. If you're going into this expecting a more centralized romance, I would caution you on that because our characters are definitely orbiting each other throughout the narrative. And there is that sense of they will be meeting, their lives will be crossing but it is a while before that happens. And it's very much character driven and focused on those characters on their separate paths and what brings those paths to merging. So if you're looking for the romance side of it, that is definitely there to a certain extent, but the plot is not centralized around that romance. It's not structured around it, I should say. So there is still a lot of sadness. There's also a plot point that if this had been any other author, I've gotten better at it. I, I don't love infidelity plot lines. I know I've talked about this before, but if you're new, you know, I don't really love it. I'm not going to avoid it like the plague by any means. I know it is unfortunately a thing that happens, but sometimes it can be hard. And here it could be hard, as I talked about in my discussion of the book itself. Uh, but I think that LaCour's voice is just very strong and she treats her characters with such grace and care. So definitely a recommend, but know that there is a sadness to this, a beautiful sadness. I believe I described it in the video. I don't know. And then I read A Rogue by Any Other Name by Sarah McLean. This was actually my first Sarah McLean novel, and I was very excited to revisit this for my book club because it loomed large in my memory. I know it's not perfect, 
but I was excited because I love a gaming hell setting. I don't know why I'm not, I've never set foot in a casino. I don't gamble, but there is something about a gaming hell that I love. I think it's that kind of lowering of inhibitions, what have you. So I was, I was excited and I was excited to revisit this as I had been revisiting romances I love to see if it kind of aligns with what I remembered. And this is a newer romance in the grand scheme of things for me, but also it's almost a decade old at this point. When I say that, I mean that Sarah McLean felt like a turning point in my own romance reading. It felt a little darker, a little grittier. It was my reading life moving from, you know, like the Bridgerton Ballroom to the Fallen Angel, the gaming hell. But at the same time, this book is almost a decade old now. So I was like, is my perception of this going to change in the same way that a lot of my perceptions of the Bridgerton books changed? And obviously the conversations around those have evolved as well as our conversations have evolved. Though some of them are the same conversations we've just been having. But also like books like The Hating Game, which I remember really liking when it came out. And when I reread it, I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. This is a lot meaner than I remember. I'm pleased to report that I still enjoyed this. This wasn't perfect. But I found it interesting because I did write a review of this for myself when I first read it and my perceptions were basically in line. So the book follows Bourne who when we open loses his entire inheritance at the gaming tables and then we meet him years later after he's kind of built a name for himself with his partners at this club called The Fallen Angel where he is a co-owner and his whole plot is a vengeance plot where he wants to regain his land from this guy who stole it from him, who was a family friend, someone he trusted. So it's all about getting back at him after he gets his land back. And the way he gets his land back is by marrying his childhood friend, Penelope. But he does it in a really devious way that it is evident that Penelope is a pawn to him, even as we see through letters that open every chapter, how large his friendship has loomed in her life as she has spent year after year not getting married. And it's not like she's not getting married because she's holding out for him by any means, but she hasn't found the right answer. And so this property was kind of a last ditch effort by her father to get her a husband by kind of bulking up her dowry because she had been jilted basically, not jilted, jilted, but pretty close uh, by a peer, one of her first seasons. And it should be said that her father was not the one that won this land from Bourne in this game. But, you know, backstory. So we've got both the sense of this past and familiarity and shared history combined with a present that puts them at odds in terms of what they view the future looking like or the future they want looking like, all mixed in with this really undeniable attraction. So there is this great heat, this great banter, and you have your real brooding hero of a McLean that kind of has to get over some emotional constipation as I talk about frequently. I will say one thing that I'm sure was intentional and like poetic and symbolic but that I had trouble kind of getting over at certain points was that like Bourne's entire life was changed by him losing everything at the gaming tables and he then is ruining people's lives at the gaming tables and he's focused on this vengeance to the point of ignoring everything else and I just kept thinking about like who at this gaming hell is he putting on a similar path of vengeance like does that never cross his mind I don't know I just found it interesting this is an undoubtedly lush atmosphere I'm excited to continue revisiting because my romance book club is going to read more of these books after we take a brief contemporary hiatus. So I'm sure I will continue to report back there as well. And then the last book I read for the month was Woman Eating by Claire Coda, which was our literary vampire novel. This was looking at the idea of hunger a lot. I personally was most compelled by its exploration of art and also kind of whose stories get to be portrayed and by who. It was very interesting because the idea of vampires in here was much more symbolic and kind of removed from the more supernatural element of it. We didn't get kind of mired in that sense of history for vampires. Our protagonist was turned as a baby by her mother, so she is kind of like her linear age. And we are coming into her story at the point where her growth 
and her reality is starting to deviate from those she grew up with. She's starting to slow. The mythology, I think, could have been built out a little bit more, but like I said, it is that literary symbolism more than anything. So I don't know that we really needed to build this whole kind of supernatural mythological world around things. It does focus a lot more on the sense of hunger and food and nourishment and kind of like where that makes us human in some ways, but I'm not unpacking that by any means to its full depth. Like I said, I was really the most compelled by the art side of things and kind of like the cultural colonialism that was explored at this weird gallery she was working at that was definitely exploiting its interns. But yeah, definitely a lot to sit with in that one. Like I said, when I talked about it, if you have any potential to worry about obsessing over food, I would skip this one. It doesn't go as in-depth as I expected it to in terms of how it talks about food, but it still does a lot. So just something to be aware of and take care of yourself there. So yeah, that was June. It wasn't the best reading month, but it also wasn't the worst, so I will take it. I'm already off to a decent start in July, so knock on wood that I don't jinx myself and we finish off strong too, and I will have a lot to talk to you about at the end of the month as well. So in the meantime, if you've read any of these books, I'd love to hear your thoughts on them as I gave kind of my cursory glances. And yeah, thanks for hanging out. Read something good and yeah.